to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. In general, when we read this passage, we stop at the moment when uh, the, the, um, the servant sees the chariots of fire and etc. But we, I, in general, I'm, I don't focus on the rest of the passage. And I want to, to discuss the whole passage to start with, in, talk, talking about enhancing our, and our sight. And what we see is that uh, the servant had a big problem. He had a medical issue, he had a problem of sight, and we'll see he also had a problem of memory. And I will start with the problem of sight. And we see that what his natural eyes see are very different from what God sees. And that, that may be an issue for us. That was an issue for me, focusing on what my natural eyes see what my rationality can handle, what my experience has taught me, instead of f focusing on what God wants to show me and want, wants to show us. And he's not the only one who has a problem of sight, because we see as we keep going that the ones who thought they saw, I mean the army looking for Elisha, they were blind. And I think they were not blind uh, physically, but they were blind spiritually. And what happened is that they thought they saw, and they had any reason to believe they saw, but they finally ended up in Samaria, where the prophet was not. And enhancing our sight is wondering, what do I see? And can I trust what I see. Can I really trust that my experience, my reading the Bible, the things I do, the things I say, etc., helps me see God's will? Or sometimes we look at people and we go, oh, maybe this person doesn't see that much, and maybe this person sees much more than you do. And this problem of sight is... Um, I wondered for myself, do I really see? Do I take time just to be there and open my vision to embrace what God wants, to, wants me to embrace? And it's something I'm still working on. It's something I really still working on because, you know, um, coming from France, in France people, in France people are not really, they don't believe in God as people believe in God here openly, etc. And if you say you believe in God, uh, you, you're kind of weak. And I used to be an atheist and I see from my past experience as an atheist, I, I, I need to be very careful about not to have a rational understanding, abstract understanding of God but something that comes from the Spirit of God. And I wrote a book that I love, which is Humans of New York. I recommend this book if you don't know it. Uh, it's a book of picture. And um, when we see a picture, um, if we don't have the caption, something that explains what the picture is all about, we can give any meaning to the picture. And yeah, we, we could say, okay, I see that, I see this thing, that thing. This book is very interesting. We call it social photography because it's all about people's portraits in New York. And there's something about the, those people's story and history. And I found one which is aligned with uh, the message. It's a story of two researchers. It's a picture of two researchers. They're sitting on a bench. And uh, this is what it says. I have to take my glasses off every time I need to read, but uh, it's, it's aging. We're eye doctors. And the author, Brendan Stanton, is asking, what's something about the eye that most people don't realize? And this is their answer. The eye doesn't see. The brain sees. The eye just transmits. So what we see is, is not only determined by what comes through the eyes. What we see is affected by our memories, 
our feelings and by what we've, been, we've seen before. And I was, how? And in social psychology, there's an, an experiment people uh, do, is they put different people in the room and they show the people a picture. And they ask them afterwards, what have you seen? And every person sees something different. And we can look at the same situation, but see different things. And based on our experience, our biases, our prejudices, our history, based on any parameter we can find, and we see things in a different way. And this is why we do need to realize that sometimes we rely on what we see, we say things, we have conviction about things, but do we realize that all, all everything that is in the background and to enhance our sight, to grow in our, our ability to see, we need to be aware of what is in the background. And we need to work on it. And we need to work hard. I need to work hard on the fact that I was an atheist. I, will, I need to work hard to say, okay, being an atheist does not uh, describe who I am. The spirit of God should describe who I am. So that was one of the problems of Gehazi. Gehazi, he, he, he had the problem of sight and he had the problem of memory. Because when he said, oh God, what's going on? And uh, we're surrounded. If you read the passages before, you see that he had experienced great victories with, uh, uh, with uh, Elisha. He had, he had witnesses, the, he had witnessed um, Naaman's being healed from leprosy. He had witnessed the fact that, yeah, the, the son had been of these uh, Shumanites, Shumanites, had been raised from the dead. He had witnessed so many great things but he had forgotten. And we see things, we kind of interpret them with, in the background, and then we forget. And that was something I, I really, um, helps me change my, my way of envisioning my, my journey uh, in, with God, just to say how much do I remember I'm not going to sing, do you remember when we fell in love? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, <laughs> but do you remember? There are a lot of songs about do you remember Phil Collins, uh, those who were in the 18s remember this, this song too. Um, but do we remember? And uh, for instance, um, I, I don't know the way you did it, but I remember as a teenager, I used to, I've always written a lot because I, uh, I need to write my feelings, emotions, and everything. And, and we have books and books and books. Maybe as a Christian, we rewrite, rewrite, we make decisions, we write things God is doing. We, we praise God for that. We, we say, God, I'm not happy with you. I'm not happy with that person. We write a lot of things. But when we put them in some books, sometimes we just put the books in a, <laughs> in the board and we may forget and last year I decided to start something to, to help me to remember and I started that I said I'm going to put that in my in my office and uh, in, in my room and just to write every every time I see a miracle from God I'm going to write it down and I can see your face and you write you go oh uh, boy it's not very impressive <laughs> <laughs> and you write you're right. It's not very impressive. If I did remember how much God has done, this should be filled up with everything. And I realized I started, you know, last uh, one year ago in September, and I'm, I'm there. So there is a problem. I don't remember. I don't find ways to remember. So that's a decision I've made just to fill it because there are so many things, so many miracles, so many answers to prayers, so many things you ask in God and you say, I leave it in your hands and God is doing it. So we do need to find ways to remember. We do need to find ways to, to put it somewhere and to praise the Lord and to worship the Lord, to say, God, this is what you've been doing. 
Wow. And, and that builds up my side, that encourages, that nurtures me. We do need to do that. And there's a, just a small passage that, uh, for me, illustrates so much this. Uh, in Luke uh, 2, yeah, verse 19. A simple verse which says Mary, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Just say that Mary has received the calling. You're going to give birth to Jesus. Um, and I, I've seen Elizabeth being pregnant. I've seen his son being, uh, uh, being born and the angels singing, etc. And we say she kept that in her heart and she pondered it. And I think this helped her be uh, at the cross at the end because she remembered. She, rem she remembered the beginning. She remembered the promises. She remembered what God has said it would do. And she could witness it. So pondering things, nurturing them in our hearts. Because we may have sight, but sometimes we may not have vision. And we may have stories, but we may not make history. And we, we need to be uh, aware of what we're building. Are we making history? Are we building a history based on our stories? When we see, do we have a vision? The second point I want to, to share with you, after enhancing our sight, is doing what we are called to do. So when we, when we see, when we know, when we remember, we should be able to do what we are called to do. So let's go to Mark to We know this great story, which makes history because we're still <laughs> reading this today. of the paralyzed man. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, oh, Why does this fellow talk like that? It's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking those, these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of, the, of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So I, I could have taken any other story that shows Jesus um, 
healing somebody, doing a miracle, making a miracle, doing a miracle, I never know. Um, and what I want to insist on is that this miracle would not have happened if the paralyzed man have not, had not decided to get up. We can see that the others helped. They carried him through the roof. They did everything they can. But when Jesus told this man, okay, please gather, he could have said, come on, Jesus. <laughs> come on. I've been that way so, for so long, and I was born this way, and etc. Come on. Don't, don't make me be ridic ridiculed uh, in, in front of everybody, because if it doesn't work, what will happen? So what happened is the man heard the calling and he did what Jesus asked him to do. And expanding our faith is for me, and I hope for you, to be able to hear the calling and do what God is asking us to do. And I had different conversations with different people, and I know I, I can have, you know, arguments, elements to, to say why I think I was asked to do that, but I don't think I should do it, or uh, I, people don't want me to do that, but I think I should do it, etc., etc. Oh, okay, let's stop it for a while. And if we hear God telling us, this is the direction you should go, I should, I should take that direction right, right away. To give glory to God only. And to say, oh, I'm where I never thought I could be. God did something I never thought it could be done. And um, this voice of faith, when we listen to it, when we hear it, it will ask every one of us, to do something specific, genuinely personal, something that only we and we, we can do. Not the person sitting next to you, not uh, somebody tomorrow, etc. You, a specific thing for each other. And what God is asking me to do, I don't, I don't know what he's asking me to do, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still looking, uh, is not what God is asking Jorge to do. Maybe. Maybe not, but as we are unique as brothers and sisters, our God's creation, we are called to do something unique. And no matter what people say, no matter if we look ridiculous or we look awkward or we look embarrassed and or whatever, 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 uh, but we have to embrace the vision and do it. And this is something I'm still working on. And I don't know if you know her, but um, Liza Nichols, which is a motivational speaker, said uh, something that, you know, resonated to me when she said, when no one gets your vision, it's because God didn't, did not give it to them. God give it, gave it to you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure. If God tells me, Michael, that direction, it's not Jorge telling me, it's God. I, I'm convinced. I, I've got the sight, the vision. I remember God telling me, okay, Michael, you can go this way. Okay, I should say, okay, yes. This is my moment. This is my journey. This is my path. This is my responsibility. This is my calling. And this is my miracle. And I want you to, 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 to keep it, to, to grab it. And we need to protect our visions, for sure. And uh, uh, it's, it's something... Uh, I'm lucky because I'm, I've, I've married a, a woman who is, who is a woman of faith. I, sometimes I did not realize how lucky I, I, I was. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, but the more we go, the more I see how lucky I am. And Crystal is, is working on faith, too. And sometimes she goes, Okay, Michael, God has given me a vision. But I'm not sharing it with you. I'm, I'm, I've written it. I know it. I know God has something planned. And I want to protect that vision. I want to nurture it. I want to nurture it with the Bible. And I say, oh, yeah. 
the vision will be not nurtured because somebody says something or somebody doesn't say something or somebody is calling me to do something or doesn't call me to, but the vision will be protected because it's encrypted in the gospel. And uh, this is why, let's go to Joshua. There, there are so many passages that show that we need to keep our visions um, based, lying in the gospel. Let's take Joshua 1. Are you still with me? Are you tired? Are you... Okay. Those, those are passages we, we know, we, but for me, they, they take a new meaning now just because of, I'm working on my faith. Um, after the death of Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, Moses said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong, be courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate it day and night, so that they may be careful, that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be, then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And what I like is that it says that we need to to dwell, to dwell, to dwell, to dwell in the gospel, in the law of God, to keep the vision and to keep uh, doing what we are supposed to do. And uh, I could have uh, quoted Romans 10 to 17 when it says that faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard from the word of Christ. So, no matter what vision we get, no matter sight, no matter, uh, no matter what we think we are called to do, if we don't dwell into the gospel, we will go astray. <laughs> and this is something I, I hope we, we, uh, we build and we're still building the conviction that it's not only what we tell each other, which is important, but how much we dwell in the gospel, what we read, what we study, what challenges us in the gospel, what inspires us, what encourages us, etc. So the gospel count cannot be replaced by <laughs> any worship, any, any fellowship, any moment we talk face to face, because this is where faith is found. And this is where faith is nurtured. So that was my second point to say that we definitely need to do what we are called to do. And we need to unroot it, root it in the gospel. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense. My third point will be that we need to protect each other's faith. We need to protect each other's faith. Let's go to Hebrews 3.
verse 7. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declare on oath, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceit deceitfulness. We keep encourage each one another daily. I'm studying, as I said, I'm studying Second Kings, and uh, this morning I've uh, I had a revelation. Just uh, I was reading Second Kings, uh, ver, uh, chapter 18, e Ezekiel, and the battle and uh, the way that uh, the um, uh, a foreign king just attacked, and uh, it was before the he had an envoy before the, in front of Jerusalem and talked against Jerusalem, trying to discourage uh, the. the um, uh, the people in Jerusalem. And what I saw from that, I saw that uh, we are in a war, a spiritual war, and comparing the tactics uh, used by this envoyé to discourage um, the, the people in Jerusalem, to say, don't, don't follow Ezekiel. And he, uh, I just re remembered it was the same tactics used by uh, the devil when Jesus was uh, tested in the desert, and the same tact tact tactics that can uh, refer to us. And what, what I saw is that um, Satan, <laughs> how he, he will attack our faith, one, one of the things he does, he attacks our identity and self-esteem. And he says, oh, okay, he, he wants us to lower our identity and self-esteem. Okay, no, you're not that good. Okay, come on, forget it. Forgot about it. Uh, when he, he, Satan said to Jesus, "Oh, are you? The, if you are the King of God, and and be, uh, the envoyé, the Syrian envoyé, was like, oh, but uh, God, yeah, no, no, uh, Ezekiel, come on, forget it. He's a bad, uh, bad king, etc." So Satan will try to attack our identity, attack. What, who we think we are, who we know, we, we first knew we were, and maybe we forgot. It will attack that. And the second thing I saw, reading that this morning and comparing all the things, it was that Satan will try to have us negotiate, trade with sin. Yeah, you know, if you leave a city, you, will, you won't be attacked and Ezekiel will be left alone, but leave the city, come live with us, etc. Uh, Jesus, okay, if you eat that, and you know, uh, that's okay. And Satan will attack us on that, negotiating. Oh, purity, that's not that important. Oh, honesty, that's not that important. Oh, loving each other. Oh, there are people we, I can love more than others. Because that's the nature of, of life. <laughs> Loving unconditionally, yeah, but it's not a, it's not a human thing. Oh, it's, it's, it's God's thing. It's not mine. Sacrifice, like, oh, I can oh, sacrifice. I said, but uh, no. Sacrifice is, mm, okay, that's fine. I'm saying that because I see that for my own life, you know. I'm not preaching to anybody, but my, uh, I'm starting with myself. And... Satan will use another thing. The third thing I saw is that it will make us doubt that God is present, that God is there. And he will, and 
Oh, no, the, your God is not in Jerusalem. He has left Jerusalem. Oh, God is not there. So when I see that, and I see all those things will hinder our faith, will attack our faith, will, will um, challenge our faith, I, I'm, I'm, I, I better understand when Hebrew 3rd 3 says, okay, therefore, take care of each other. Have each other's back. Have each other's back for us to never forget who we are. Or to, to capture that, to see, okay, no matter where we are, we are, we are God's creation. Have each other's back just to be able to, to see uh, that we will not negotiate with sin. We will encourage each other not to negotiate with sin. Have each other back to see how great our God is and how faithful, how, yeah. So we need to protect each other's faith and we need, I, I, I strongly believe, we need to go much beyond what we're living now as a community to protect each other's faith, to see each other's faith, to speak about each other's faith, to see the miracles going on in our lives and how God is, uh, and we were there and this is what God did, etc., etc. And I think that that would be a huge, <laughs> a huge improvement, a great thing here for us to, to encourage each other with our faith and our victories. So to finish with, so my, few, my, my three points that you got it was, was just to, to enhance our sight. Um, my second point, what is, was it? Re remembering, yeah, it was part of, uh, and do what we got to do. And, and protect each other. And I want to finish with Jesus because it comes, it all starts with Jesus and it finishes with Jesus. And because I, I do think that Jesus was the ultimate example of believing, and knowing who he was, having the vision, remember, making a, a remember putting things into actions, putting uh, deeds behind, behind words, and communicating his faith, protecting the disciples' faith. But imagine one second that Jesus, after being uh, in Gethsemane, he prayed and he, uh, he prayed and he prayed. That was so hard. And he went to the Sanhedrin and they spoke. And Jesus said, okay, you know what? That's too hard. That's too hard. I, I, can't, I can't take it. I, I'm pray I've prayed. I've seen God's will, God's vision, but uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's really God's vision to, or to save all those people. That's too hard. So let's make a deal. Let's make a deal, okay? I know I've got to go to the cross, so I'm going to go to the cross. And uh, yes, you can beat me because, uh, okay, it's part of the game. I'll be so crucified. But please make sure I don't die. And please make sure I can get from that cross. And uh, you know what Jesus said finally? He hid himself in Egypt. And he bred sheep. And this is the way it finished. And, okay, but some Peter knew about that, so they, they knew a few things, and they wrote a book, some books, about how great Jesus was, how great the, the teaching was, and uh, Jesus is a nice guy to follow. I think sometimes we live our Christian life just as if that was the story we heard, that Jesus, okay, he died on the cross, and Okay, or maybe not. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I do know. Sometimes I don't know. And, okay, and the teaching is nice. And this is what God is expecting from me, to hear a nice teaching. But that's, that's not why we are here. <laughs> and that's not why you have made the decision to come today, because you came after out of faith. 
you came by faith. You came because you, you believe that in the gospel, there's something strong. There's something, there's a life-changing uh, message to hear. Uh, you came because maybe you don't feel that close to God, but you hope that hearing about God, just a drop of God's gospel can make a difference. This is the kind, I do believe this is the kind of faith we have. Because if you did not have this faith, you would not be there on a Sunday morning, on a sunny Sunday morning to hear the gospel. So just what I want you to grasp is no matter how big is your faith this morning, no matter how big it is, it is worth it. It is worth it because Jesus died for that. Because Jesus died saying that everything will be renewed. You can be born again. You can have a new hope. You can have a new expectation. And I want, you, I want to finish here, just with her focusing on, on Jesus, to say that, okay, maybe I need to enhance my sight. Okay, maybe I need to do, to start doing what I'm called to do. Or, yeah, but there is a foundation that is Jesus, that can do it for me if I'm not strong enough. And I want to <laughs> take his hand. I want maybe not his hand, his, his robe, or whatever I grasp from Jesus, whatever I can understand from him, whatever I can accept from him, I, I take it, and I don't let go about Jesus. This is what I wanted to communicate, never letting go of Jesus and never letting go of our faith to expand it. Let's pray for uh, communion. Holy Father, it's, uh, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to come before you and uh, uh, no matter our condition, <laughs> no matter our spiritual health, uh, no matter what we do or we don't do, you know better than us. You know better than we do. You know our hearts. You know our everything. You've created us. And because you have created us, we are so precious in uh, your hands. And we want to stick to that knowledge that we are precious. Our identity in you is precious. And that you have great things ahead for us. Individually, there are things you will do with us. You can do with us. You want to do with us. You will do with us. You have already done by faith. There are things that you have already changed. Miracles that have already happened. Help us grasp the call of faith. Help us dwell in the power which is in Jesus Christ. Dwell in the fact that there are no dead things before you. There are no weak things before you. Before you, because you are life, you are life, strength, love, redemption, grace, empowerment, growth. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the calling of faith. And thank you for enabling every one of us to make the decisions we need to make to better understand who you are in your gospel, in your calling. You said, Jesus, that if we prayed something in your name, we could be sure you had already done it. This is why, Holy Jesus, I'm praying in your name for the miracles in our community, where we live, where we work, in our worship, in this group, to be seen, and for us to say, 
l'Éternel a fait pour nous de grandes choses. God has done great things for us. We're praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.